Welcome back, everyone. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, Apple has officially sent out the invites for their September 12th event. This is the next big Apple event, and we're going to be going over the details of what to expect. We have the market in the green three days in a row, and we have here Dan Ives predicting that tech stocks in particular are going to rip higher. He came on an interview and stated just that. So we'll be looking at his comments and why he thinks tech stocks are gonna do so well for the rest of the year. And then finally, we have some big news that Visa and MasterCard are both up big today. They're up way more than the market. MasterCard's up 1.26% today. Both of these companies, Visa and MasterCard, are trading higher following a report suggesting the companies are preparing to raise credit card fees. And we have that report. It's a Wall Street Journal exclusive where they're going over how Visa and MasterCard are now preparing to raise fees once again. And you better believe every time they want to raise fees, there's a lot of people, including lawmakers, that don't want them to. So we're going to be going over this issue of the moat of Visa and MasterCard, whether they can continue to get away with this or whether competition or Congress will stop these companies, because so far they remain undefeated. So as always, we have a lot to get into. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Now, I'll start off with a portfolio update. This is my passive income portfolio. It's my biggest investment vehicle. And we've had three days of gains in the portfolio, leading the SPAC close to $100,000 in gains. So far, I've been very happy with the performance of this portfolio. Now, the investing strategy that I do is a bit different than what other content creators are doing on YouTube and on TikTok and on Twitter. I don't like risk. I don't seek out risk with my investments. In fact, I feel like risk is the obstacle, the thing that I wanna control and minimize in as many ways as possible. So I invest in companies that I consider to be low risk. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm putting my money in cash or buying bonds. That's not the way that I think that you reduce risk. I believe that low risk companies are ones that have dominant market positions, high barriers to entry. They have deeply entrenched brand names and distribution. Companies that have cash rich balance sheets. They have organic revenue growth, lots of pricing power, and they have no reliance on high research and development costs. All in all, those are low risk businesses. And these are the exact type that I try to compile in my portfolio. Now they're not just low risk, they're also high growth. These companies have above average growth rates in both their top line revenue, their EBITDA, their net income, their earnings per share, and their free cash flow on a per share basis. So these companies are low risk and they're high growth. And that is the combination I look for in these companies. Now there's also something you may notice with the holdings that I have. I say these are companies that typically have high barriers to entry. They have deeply entrenched brand and distribution moats. Some of these companies can be described as being toll booths. A toll booth sits upon a road. When you cross over it, you have to pay the toll to go across the road. Being the toll booth collector is a very advantageous position. You basically just sit there and collect fees without doing much work. Many companies like S&P Global have elements of their business that are toll booth like. This company along with Moody's collects fees anytime a company issues debt and has that debt rated by S&P Global and Moody's. They've also built out other toll booth businesses owning a tremendous amount of the data that's being sold to market participants. Now MasterCard, one of my main holdings here and one of the companies we're gonna be discussing is the quintessential example of a toll booth company. Along with Visa, they form a duopoly over credit card processing. Because of the interchange fees that they charge, they're able to collect fees every time someone uses their card by swiping it or by typing in the numbers online. MasterCard collects part of that transaction. Now, all of these companies, to some extent, you could argue have a bit of a toll booth. Intuit has this with small businesses. They have a virtual monopoly on small business tools. Apple has one of the best toll booths in the world, which is the App Store. They sit upon one of the busiest roads in the entire universe, all of those transactions going through the App Store, and they charge a fee for many of those transactions. That fee accumulates to be a massive amount of money for Apple, and it goes up almost every year. Toll booth companies are highly attractive, and they're common amongst the best investors in the world. You may have noticed that in Buffett's portfolio, he has many of the companies that we describe as toll booth companies, Apple being one of them, American Express. He owns Moody's Corporation, and Visa, and MasterCard. You can pluck out one out of every four of the companies that he owns, and it's a toll booth company. And most notably, the one that's weighted the absolute highest is a huge toll booth company. Now, whether or not Buffett seeks out toll booth companies or whether or not they just naturally meet the requirements he looks for, that's up for debate. But either way, a lot of them tend to make it into super investors' portfolios like Buffett's. 
But toll booth companies always seem to be under attack. They always seem to be talked about like they don't offer a lot of value. We've seen the recent attacks that Apple has faced. They were sued by Epic Games for kicking the game out of their app store, and this caused a ton of drama. Epic Games is furious at the market position that Apple has. Now, because Apple technically doesn't have a monopoly, at least by the way the laws are written, they were excited to go to court and argue their case, and Apple had a resounding victory defending their app store and the fees that they charge. So the toll booth of Apple lives on, and so do the profits for investors like me. But another company that's coming under a lot of heat recently, and one that's been the target for many people in law and many people in retail, is MasterCard and Visa. These companies have become the big boogeyman of the market, because these companies are just so good. When I review the analysis of companies, and I've looked at many of them, I've selected what I believe are the top 1% of the top 1% of companies, Visa and MasterCard are in a league of their own. It's like you have normal companies, 99.999% of them, then you have Visa and MasterCard, which are just abnormal. They don't fit into any other category. The first thing about these companies is that they dramatically outperform the rest of the market over long periods of time. 460%, not including dividends over the past decade, that's beat out the QQQ and the S&P 500. The companies have incredibly resilient revenue growth, growing every year by 10 to 11%. Even during recessions or pandemics, it goes down temporarily, but then it returns back to all-time highs. Now, it's not just the top-line growth that's magical about these companies. The real magic comes in with the economics behind them. For example, out of the $29 billion in revenue, $20 billion was EBITDA. So from 29 to $20 billion in EBITDA, that is an incredible conversion of economics. The free cash flow conversion is also astounding. The company generated $17.8 billion in free cash flow off of a year that they did $29 billion in revenue. So they generate over 50% free cash flow from revenue. And if we factor in dilution or expenses, these companies are incredibly efficient. $600 million in stock-based comp based on $17.8 billion in free cash flow. Big tech looks bloated and slow compared to Visa. And to put this in perspective of how fast a company like Visa is growing in its economics, in the actual cash flows that investors receive, over the past 10 years, Visa has outgrown Google. They've outgrown Microsoft, they've outgrown Meta, and they've outgrown Amazon. The only big tech company that's outpaced them in this metric is Apple, which has had unusually high growth over the past five years. Apple beat Visa by releasing AirPods, by releasing the Apple Watch, by upgrading iPhones, upgrading tablets, creating an M1 chip, and doing a tremendous amount of innovation and work. But Visa has nearly kept up in economic growth while simply running the same old business they always have. And with MasterCard, this really hasn't been any different. In fact, the only noticeable difference with MasterCard is over the past five years, it's growing a little bit faster. And frankly, a lot of people seem to be frustrated with it. They're frustrated that Visa and MasterCard continue to do so well. Against any level of competition, against any legislation, these companies seem impenetrable. They seem like they're just these big growth monsters that charge fees, and they can grow without offering any real innovation, and some argue that they don't offer really any value to consumers as well. And then on top of those frustrations, we have the news that Visa and MasterCard are preparing to raise credit card fees once again. What can people do to stop them? Well, that's the question. But with that news, this is a reaction of retailers and Congress. You can't keep getting away with this! You can't keep getting away with it! They're not happy about this, and they think there's got to be some way to stop Visa and MasterCard. Now, there have been some that have argued that Visa and MasterCard will be taken care of by the natural competitive forces of the market, including crypto projects. This is one of the takes back in 2021 from the great Chamath Palihapitiya. He's someone that has become almost this routine giver of terrible takes. Let's go ahead and listen to his predictions of what was going to happen to Visa and MasterCard in 2022. My biggest business loser for 2022 is Visa and MasterCard and traditional payment rails and the entire ecosystem around it. So I think that this is the year you can put on what probably will be the most profitable spread trade of my lifetime, which is to be short these companies and that anybody that basically lives off of this 2 or 3% tax and be long, well thought out, 
Web3 crypto projects that are rebuilding payments infrastructure in a completely decentralized way. So Chamas' advice for the most profitable spread trade was to be long crypto projects and to be short Visa MasterCard. And of course, if you did that, you would probably be bankrupt right now, or at least have lost a lot of money. The complete opposite has happened. Most crypto projects have gone under or have been under great distress. Visa and MasterCard are hitting all new highs. So while a company like MasterCard is sailing to the sky with its stock price, they now feel like it's a good time to raise the fees of credit cards. So let's go ahead and look at this inside report from the Wall Street Journal. They say the fee increase are scheduled to start in October and April. Many of the increases are for online purchases. Now, this is something where even though these companies are really big, a lot of people don't understand really the relationship of how Visa and MasterCard work with banks, merchants, and customers. Visa and MasterCard are actually not the biggest hog of fees in this process. That's the banks. For example, here's a flow of what typically will happen. We have the customer pay $100 with their credit card. The issuing bank will take around $1.75. The card network processor only gets around 14 cents. So not that much actually goes to the credit card processors. The payment processor gets 30 cents and then the merchant gets the remainder of $97.81. So the split between this is actually more favorable for banks than it is for Visa and MasterCard. And that's the reason that banks love when Visa and MasterCard raise the interchange fee. It means more money for the banks as well. And that also means that they can pay you higher amounts of credit card rewards. And when a company says that they're going to raise interchange fees, there's not like some core fee that's interchange and it's just one set percentage. The interchange fees are incredibly complex. There's dozens of different percentages based on the different types of transactions you're doing. For example, there's card present EMV, that's 0.92%. There's unsecured card present, there's digital commerce, there's contactless. There's of course the standard rate, and then there's the separate fees for charity and utility. So this is a breakdown based on where you're buying, what you're buying, if you're buying online and if you have your card or not. All of this breakdown is summarized as the interchange fee. And from the Wall Street Journal here, they're saying that most of the raising of price is going to be with online purchases. I can see this helping out Visa and MasterCard a lot as more and more shopping goes online. The changes could result in merchants paying up to an additional $502 million in annual fees. So when we break down the actual math of this, this $502 million is actually less than a 1% raise in revenue. Now they say that card networks such as Visa and MasterCard set the fees that the merchants pay. Network fees get pocketed by Visa and MasterCard, interchange fees go to the bank, that issued the card. Visa and MasterCard and the big banks have set up fees to help cover related costs to fraud prevention and innovation. The banks often use the money they get from interchange fees to fund popular credit card reward programs. So that's the basic effect. They're raising prices ever so slightly, and more importantly, the banks can give more rewards to consumers. Now, when I look at the news of a price increase, I see this as a definite positive for these companies because it shows that they're not too concerned about both competitive forces or the government. There has been some threats to Visa and MasterCard with a new bill proposed by Mr. Durbin, one of the senators who was one of the original ones that proposed the bill that killed the rewards for debit cards. So he was one of the ones that really shut down the rewards for debit cards, and he's trying to do the same thing for credit cards. But this bill, which is a very, very bad bill for consumers, at this point is unlikely to be passed, and I haven't seen any movement whatsoever of this bill through Congress. Right now, it seems to be at a standstill. Now, part of being an investor and seeing these companies raise prices is always assessing the future risk of this company. Because when I look at my investment in MasterCard, this is a massive investment. It's ballooned up to a $65,800 holding, now with $8,000 in the green. And this is a company that I bought into new this year. I was looking over this company and how it's been trading over the past five years. It spiked up in 2021 like a lot of other great companies, but then it started to sell off. Investors were really sour on these companies in 2022. We had people like Chamath Palihapitiya saying that the best days for Visa MasterCard are over. And I just viewed that advice as being wrong. I thought this time period right here was a good time to start buying into this company because I believe one of the most important things an investor can do is accurately assess the future risks facing a company. When I look at the future risks facing MasterCard and Visa, 
I don't see any competitive threat that I believe is credible. I still do not believe that crypto poses a credible threat to MasterCard and Visa. And I do not believe consumers are going to like a bill that wipes out their credit card rewards. So Congress is going to have a difficult time passing that legislation. Both of those threats currently are very low for MasterCard and Visa. The company that I continually see as the biggest threat for Visa MasterCard's moat is Apple. I really think this is the biggest one. Apple Pay has a concentration of so many people's digital wallets in a single place. And having that concentration of power lends Apple a lot of leverage over consumer behavior. Even though Visa and MasterCard right now are working with Apple, things could change in the future. So when I'm looking over either of these companies, Visa and MasterCard, right now I still consider Apple to be the biggest threat but it's not a big enough threat for me to be concerned about my current position. And I'll continue to hold my shares in MasterCard unless that changes. But as of right now, I have no concerns over the moats of these companies. Now, moving on, we have some news coming out of Apple. They officially released the invites to their new iPhone 15 event called Wonderlust. And Apple's one of my largest holdings. I've gone over this one many times in the past. So I haven't done analysis on Apple in some time, but if you search Joseph Carlson Apple, you'll see many videos of me going over the case on this. Now, every time there's an Apple event, I notice the same thing happens. The stock usually is a little bit excited. The stock price goes up leading into the event, and then there's a sell-off after the event. So I expect nothing different this time. But let's go ahead and take a look at what Apple's releasing in this event. Now, all of this is rumored. It's not officially confirmed, but we have the iPhone 15, iPhone 15 Plus, iPhone 15 Pro, and iPhone 15 Pro Max. So basically the entire lineup of the iPhone 15. The iPhone 15 will largely inherit the features from the iPhone 14 Pro. This includes an A16 Bionic chip, Dynamic Island, a 48 megapixel camera, a fresh set of colors, and USB-C charging will round out the list of changes. So lots of little upgrades there, but one of the notable ones, which I'm actually personally excited about, is moving away from the lightning charger to a simple USB-C charging. Every device I have in my house charges by USB-C except my iPhone. So it's gonna be nice to have all of that in uniform. Now they say the iPhone Pro Max will have an A17 Bionic chip, the first three nanometer processor in a smartphone, action button, a programmable button that replaces the mute switch, a titanium frame, a lighter material will replace the stainless steel, design refresh, thinner bezels, and slider curved edges. USB-C charging port will replace the lightning port, battery life improvements, a periscope zoom lens. That's going to be in the iPhone 15 Pro Max only. New gray and dark blue colors replacing gold and purple, higher storage tears, and last but not least, a higher starting price from $1099 to $1199. So they're incrementally bumping up the price of their higher tier phones by another $100. Now there's gonna be tech reviewers after this is released that are gonna go through and show you how great or not great these features are. We don't need to do that to know that these changes are in a positive direction. Every year they incrementally improve their overall design of their phone, keeping the lead between them and their competitors greater and greater. And every couple of years, like every great company, they tend to raise prices. You'll notice that raising prices is a common theme among strong companies. Now, Apple's revenue is in a bit of a slump. We've had three consecutive quarters of it being lower and lower year over year each quarter. And this could continue on for a little bit, but I think that it's a temporary thing. Apple is going to grow revenues over time. And with their install base growing, the amount of people using their services, Apple Insurance and the App Store, the amount of people that are on that road that passes through the toll booth gets greater and greater. So Apple's another one of these companies that a lot of investors look at the Ford PE of the company. They say that it's trading at a high multiple, a 25 Ford PE, while the market's at a 20. And Apple's growing slower in revenue than the rest of the market, Therefore, Apple's a bad buy. I think that's a very poor form of analysis and it will lead to underperformance. The most important part of Apple is the economic durable advantage, otherwise called the moat. And as far as I'm concerned, the moat has literally never been bigger for this company. Now, moving on, we have Dan Ives, who's one of these, he's one of the investors that focuses on big tech. And I have a little bit in common there. I love big tech. I think these companies dominate the markets. They have incredible economics. They have wide moats and they're continually perpetually undervalued. But he's asked why he thinks these companies will continue to race higher 
even though they're becoming, technically speaking, crowded trades. So doesn't that mean that we should be careful because they're becoming so crowded? I think those are all the arguments that the bears are making. I think it just comes down to the growth. I mean, what, what I believe, and I think we'll see with Salesforce, I think we'll see with a lot of these off-quarter earnings pow out, though, of course, th this is going to be a strong fundamental performance from tech, from software, from chips, going in the second half of the year. And in my opinion, despite the Fed, despite what we see in terms of the 10-year, I think they tech powers through this. We see 12, 15 percent gain second half of the year. And I think it goes into 2024. We believe the new tech bull market is here. Now, this might seem like a big, bold statement, but I don't think it really should be. We had 2022, which was a horrible year for tech. All of these companies went down like crazy. So it makes sense that we should be starting a new tech bull run. These companies are now off to a good start. Their economics are improving. We know that Apple's slowing down a little bit in top line revenue growth, but other companies like Amazon are focusing intensely on profitability. Alphabet as well. This company's becoming far more efficient and growing in its profits. Now they turn the attention to Nvidia. This is one of the big tech companies now, one of the magnificent seven that's had an incredible rise. This has been one that I've missed. I don't have FOMO. I'm not afraid of missing out on NVIDIA, but it's simply one of the companies that's outside of my level of predictability. I don't know what direction NVIDIA is going to go. I don't know what their cash flows are going to look like in the future, and I don't know how sustainable their mode is. And Dan Ives has asked about this being priced in, because even though NVIDIA had an incredible quarter, the stock price after this last report has remained relatively flat. Yeah, I think that was a knee jerk, no doubt. And I think that definitely scared a lot of investors that I talked to, right? Like, if, if NVIDIA, put, the godfather of AI, Jensen, puts up a quarter like that and the stock sells off, what is that telling you? But I believe we sit here six, eight weeks from now and that stock is much higher be, because ultimately it just comes down to fundamentally it's unprecedented growth that we haven't seen in 30 years since Internet in But So wait, you said, what is that telling you? So it's not telling you anything? What's well, the answer? I, I think it's telling you that that was a knee-jerk reaction that I don't think is going to be sustainable. I believe NVIDIA and overall tech is going to go, I, we believe it rips much higher into the second half of the year. I view that pause that we saw post, you know, sort of sell-off as more of a golden buying opportunity, not the time in my opinion, to get out of this, because I believe this is just halftime of a Super Bowl type tech rally that we see going in to the next uh, 18, 24 months. You can criticize Dan Ives all you want for lots of different points here. For example, I don't like the fact that he makes short term predictions on stock price movements. That's something that I don't like to do. I've never tried to say that I think stocks are going to rip higher the second half of this year. But I do like the fact that he focuses on the fundamental developments of these companies, and that's the basis on which he believes these stocks are going to move higher. So I again find myself agreeing with Dan Ives. Even though I don't agree with his prediction per se about the prediction of stock prices moving up, I do agree about his prediction of these companies being a step above the rest and them having pricing power and economic growth. Each of these companies, I think, will have higher free cash flow in 2024 than 2023. Is there a name in the in the Magnificent Seven or Mega Cap 8 that you would underweight at this point? Well, I mean, look, our, our top picks have clearly been, if you look at Amazon, if you look at Apple, I think from a if there's a name that you'd underweight here, Look, I think Meta's obviously had that massive move that we, we believe probably a lot of that is, is probably not going to be as significant as some of the others. I think the one that I view as a table pounder is Apple, because in my opinion, going into this iPhone 15 cycle, it's massively underestimated by the street just how big this install base upgrade is going to be. And I think Cupertino continues to play chess, others play checkers. The table pounders Apple. That's the one he thinks investors should be the most focused on. Of course, no argument from me here. Apple is in an outstandingly good position right now. But there you have it from Dan Ives. He's predicting more bullishness out of this market. And you have to give credit where credit is due. Dan Ives has been correct basically all year long and even leading into this year. Other super investors, many notable ones like Michael Burry, who have been short on the market and buying puts and saying sell, they've had some pretty poor calls lately. This is why it's difficult to make big predictions. The market can be extremely humbling. But that's going to wrap up this episode. If you'd like to see more content, you can check out the Patreon. It's at a very low price. It offers Qualtrum.com as well, which is the data analysis tool I use. 
We have a Discord community full of thousands of members and over 100 exclusive episodes. So check that out if you get a chance. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next episode.